Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and devices to silent for the duration of the meeting? Today, we have received apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP. We move to agenda item one. Uh, it's a piece of draft subordinate legislation which is subject to the affirmative procedure. Information about the instrument is provided in paper one. It should explain that the affirmative instrument has two agenda items. The first is an opportunity for the Cabinet Secretary to explain the instrument and for members to ask questions of the Cabinet Secretary and his officials. You will then turn to agenda item two, where there will be a debate on the motion and the instrument that is in the published agenda. And I'd like to welcome to committee this morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary John Swinney, for, uh, Secretary for Education and Skills, David Roy, Head, Teacher, Head of Teacher Education and Leadership, and Claire Cullen, Legal Director at School Education Branch of the Scottish Government. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement on the instrument. Thank you, Convener. I welcome the opportunity this morning to address the committee in connection with the proposed introduction of a requirement that all teachers appointed to their first permanent head teacher post in local authority or grant aided schools from August 2020 should hold the standard for headship. The standard for headship is awarded by the General Teaching Council for Scotland on successful completion of the Interheadship Programme, which is offered by seven universities. A priority of the Scottish Government is to improve the life chances and education of all children in Scotland. Leadership is recognised as one of the most important aspects of the success of any school. Highly effective leadership is key to ensuring the highest possible standards and expectations are shared across schools to achieve excellence and equity for all. This in turn helps to ensure that all children achieve the best possible outcomes. There is currently no requirement for head teachers to hold the standard of, for headship prior to their appointment. Since 2005, there has been an expectation that teachers should meet the standard of headship before they can be appointed as a head teacher by completing either one of two programmes, the Scottish Qualification for Headship um, or the, Scottish, the, the Flexible Route to Headship, or through the judgment of local authorities as employers. The SQH and FRH programmes are no longer available and, are replaced, and were replaced by the Interheadship Qualification in 2015, at the same time as the decision was taken uh, to make holding the standard for headship a legal requirement for all permanent head teacher appointments. The standard for headship is part of a suite of professional standards managed by the General Teaching Council that supports the self-evaluation and professional learning of those in or aspiring to leadership roles in schools. Uh, powers were acquired under Section 28 of the Education Scotland Act 2016, which amended the 1980 Education Scotland Act by inserting sections 90A and 98DA into the 1980 Act, which allows Scottish ministers to make regulations prescribing the standards of education and training needed before a person could be appointed as a head teacher of an education authority, grant aided or independent school. The committee took evidence on this proposal as part of the development of what became the Education Scotland Act 2016. There was agreement during the passage of the 2016 Act that the regulations relating to the independent sector would not be brought forward as we were bringing in full GTS registration for all teachers within the sector. It is not our intention at present to extend the requirement to hold the standard for headship to head teacher appointments in independent schools and only state and grant aided schools fall within the scope of the regulations being considered today. It was clear from early discussions with stakeholders and the consultation on the draft regulations that there were some reservations about sufficient numbers of teachers having achieved the standard for headship to support future vacancies when the regulations would come into force. We took on board these concerns in two ways. Um, firstly, by moving the coming into force date from August 2019 to August 2020, and secondly, by extending the period for which a teacher can be appointed to a head teacher post on a temporary basis without holding the standard from 24 months to 30 months. This provides a temporarily appointed head teacher sufficient time to undertake the interheadship programme, which is usually completed within 18 months, while giving local authorities reasonable flexibility in terms of workforce planning. The education sector is fully aware of the intended commencement date of August 2020, and local authorities are taking steps to plan, encourage and select teachers to undertake the interheadship programme. Through the recommendations within the Head Teacher Recruitment Working Group report published last November, we are working in partnership with the sector to enhance the support for teachers to encourage them into leadership roles. The Scottish Government fully funds the Interheadship Programme. 
We understand the importance of excellent school leadership and uh, don't want fees to be a barrier to those who want to take the step to a headship role. As of this summer, nearly 800 teachers will have embarked on the inter-headship programme. We are committed to investing in aspiring head teachers and want to provide them with high quality professional learning. We will continue to fund the inter-headship qualification uh, to the end of this parliament. Further support will be provided through the Enhanced Leadership Support Package, building on the existing suite of programmes managed by Education Scotland. Along with our continued investment in the into headship uh, and excellence in headship programmes, uh, along with the Head Teacher Leadership Academies. Uh, the draft regulations in front of the committee today have therefore been drafted to provide that from the 1st of August 2020, only head teachers who have been awarded the standard for headship can be permanently appointed as a head teacher in an education authority or granted at school. Uh, there are two exemptions. The first applies to any permanent head teacher who has been appointed to a position in an education authority granted at school or independent school on or prior to the 1st of August 2020. For individuals within that category, holding of the standard for headship is not a requirement. The second exemption enables education authorities or managers of grant aided schools to appoint a person to a head teacher post who has not attained the standard for headship on a temporary basis for a period not ex exceeding uh, 30 months after the 1st of August 2020. I'm very happy to answer any points in the committee. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to open um, with Mr Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just for the avoidance of doubt, I certainly support the instrument and I think it um, uh, is a, a good move in terms of um, r raising both the standards, I think, and the status of the, the profession of head teacher. So, um, but I do have uh, a concern I wanted to raise, which is based on the uh, AHDS uh, workload survey, which I think the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of, which they produced quite recently. Uh, and in that survey, one of the most uh, worrying tables presented uh, is a table which looks at um, current deputy uh, and principal teachers in primary schools and their enthusiasm, their keenness to move on to become <coughs> head teachers. And it shows um, a very low level of, of willingness to consider uh, that move. They clearly see that the increased uh, responsibility uh, and accountability uh, is something which uh, they uh, think twice about. Perhaps I can put it like that. Uh, and clearly we are introducing a a further requirement in order to make that jump. So I just wonder what the Cabinet Secretary has thought about what he can do to try and address a potential problem in recruitment of head teachers in the future. The first thing, the first thing, I very much welcome the, the context within which Mr Gray has made has said his question. Um, I think the first thing I need to do is acknowledge the, um, the detail of the survey that's come from the AHDS and, and what that you know, and the requirement for us mm. to address that substantively. Uh, I think the, there are a number of things that we, we can do. The first is that I very deliberately in the pay deal that we agreed with the professional associations so, some weeks ago um, extended that to include issues of workload and one element of that was about working with the professional associations collaboratively on tackling the genuine concerns that are expressed about workload. So essentially I want to uh, embrace the professional associations as partners in trying to, to address what can we collaboratively and constructively do to tackle the workload issues to address the, the very perceptions that Mr Gray highlights. The second thing is that I think we have got to um, ensure, and, and this is perhaps less relevant in um, some aspects of, in some primary schools, but it will be present in many, uh, that there are sufficient career development structures which enable individuals to break down the gap between, for example, being a classroom teacher and being a head teacher. And I think one of the, we will shortly be receiving the, rec the recommendations from the um, panel on career pathways that Moira Bolland has been leading for us in the, the University of Glasgow. And what that is going to give us is some more career development opportunities that will essentially break down that gap 
that exists, which I accept is, a, is, a, is, is for some people a very big gap to contemplate. And even from a deputy to a head teacher is quite a big gap. Um, and those issues will be considered by the SNCT in due course. Uh, and then the third thing is that we want to, we, we have put in place um, other supports to try to enhance the professional development of individuals, which will then enable them to perhaps be more professionally confident in taking on such roles. So interventions such as the Columba 1400 programme, which is now eligible for deputy head teachers as well as head teachers, is an important contribution in trying to address some of the professional development requirements that individuals will feel they have to be able to progress on to a head teacher role. So I think it's a combination between professional development and the tackling of workload issues will provide us with uh, some of the means to address the legitimate issues that are raised by the survey. I mean, that, that's all very welcome. Um, there are some who think that one of the problems here is that, um, depending on the size of school and those kind of issues, that, um, frankly, the salary differential <coughs> between deputy head and head um, is sometimes um, small. In fact, it's sometimes nothing at all, depending on, as I say, the size of the school, and that doesn't reflect the increase in workload. So the consideration of workload that you've just described does that encompass uh, job sizing of primary head teacher and that pay differential as well? Is that part well, that of would, that? That, that would be, that, that's part of the work that will be undertaken in implementing the pay and workload okay. agreement that we reached a few weeks ago where mm -hmm. I accepted the need to revisit the questions of job sizing okay. uh, for head teachers, which, I, again, I think there's substantive evidence that there are issues that need to be addressed there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms Smith? Can I also welcome uh, these measures? And I think they have also been broadly welcomed in principle by uh, many teachers and the associations uh, which represent them. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I just ask two uh, technical points? Uh, you mentioned here that these regulations provide that from the 1st of August uh, 2020, that uh, that will be the date where uh, they can pick up the headship. Um, how long does it take to uh, undertake this course? And at what stage will you be able to uh, tell the Parliament uh, how many teachers are undertaking uh, that course to meet that date? Uh, well, the, the course it normally takes 12 to 18 months to, to complete. And in terms of the, you know, the, the, the inter-headship qualification has been operating since 2015. And if I, I, I could put on the record the, the, uh, the, the data, in 2015, 119 uh, were qualified uh, or achieved the standard. 2016, 142. 217, 155. Uh, 2018, 166. And 2019, 180. Uh, now, as members will recognise, those numbers are rising year on year, which is a very encouraging trend. Interestingly, there is now a much larger differential in 2019 in primary head teachers versus secondary head teachers. So in 2019, for example, well, in 2015, the primary and secondary was pretty 50-50. Mm -hmm. In um, 2019, two-thirds primary school, one-third secondary school, which perhaps addresses some of the issues that Mr Gray was raising with yeah. me as well. So. That's an encouraging trend in terms of the absolute numbers of uh, head teachers that are coming forward, and um, the split is now more weighted, as, as one would expect, because there are um, seven times as many primary schools as there are secondary schools weighted more towards uh, primary schools than uh, we the, 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 than was the case when we began the, the standard. Um, just one final point of clarification, which I, 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 I may have misheard from what Liz Smith said, but the, uh, th there is no requirement for an existing head teacher right. to undertake this standard, yep. but any aspiring head teacher seeking to fill a post subject to the exemptions I've set out would have to have that by the 1st of August 2020. Right, so they're included in that last figure that you've given, because presumably they've started on their... Um, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Uh, and, the, and, and, to, and that totals uh, over eight hundred. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lamont. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, from what, from one understanding, um, 
In order to go on the programme, is it entirely about the individual, or is, it gate, is there a gatekeeper somewhere who determines whether you're able to go on the programme, given that it's being funded, um, and in those circumstances, how are we ensuring that there is diversity, that you know, men and women are both equally able to take up these um, opportunities? Essentially, uh, eligibility for the programme is determined by local authorities, um, so they will be essentially identifying candidates as part of their workforce planning that will enable them to, uh, to take forward. But obviously individuals would present themselves as, wi as willing to do this and local authorities would consider the, um, uh, the potential for individuals to take forward that standard. So do you think there's a place though for monitoring what's happening? You would be concerned if, if it is a matter for the local authorities, how wide are they spreading their net? how encouraging they are of, of folk who find it, might find it, if they've got caring responsibilities or whatever, to take that kind of commitment on, or may themselves not have thought about it? I think we should, I think we should monitor these issues very carefully. And I think it's part of the, you know, I think the, the we have, I, I have relatively recently um, responded to parliamentary questions about the diversity of the teaching profession, and it's, um, and, and there are, issues about the diversity of the teaching profession in general, which we need to consider uh, as a system. And uh, I, I, I don't think the uh, issues about eligibility for the inter-headship programme are any different to those questions of, uh, of, uh, that, that arise out of that, uh, but, that analysis. But you would be expecting local authorities to be transparent about how they're identifying people for this? I would, yes. And the, the, the last question is maybe just... Um, Again, just to satisfy my own understanding of this, if somebody's on a 30-month temporary contract and they haven't completed the programme, does that mean you would then have to find somebody else to be a head teacher on a temporary programme? I don't. I don't think I would. I, I. I think that would be. I don't think it would be within the spirit of the regulations that if somebody was was trying to endeavour to complete the programme, and as as John Lamont has said something had got in the way, a caring responsibility or illness or some other circumstance. You know, the regulation is not set in such a fashion that um, there is no scope for discretion in understanding particular cases. Um, and uh, I, I think that, and that flexibility would exist with local authorities as the employers to make that judgment. So you could end up, despite the regulation, you could end up with people continuing in temporary contracts over a longer period of time? I, I think that would be against the spirit of the, 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 the regulation, because the, the regulation is saying after the 1st of August 2020, um, it should be a mandatory requirement to have that standard. If somebody is demonstrating no uh, intention of completing the programme, then it would be, in my view, against the spirit of the regulations. But if, there are, if, if they've commenced the programme and something has got in the way, um, but it, it's, 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 not, um, you know, it's not in the spirit of, uh, of the regulations. But, so you've got somebody who's on a temporary contract on condition that they do this, they don't do it. And the, at the end of that, this, the local authority would need to interview to appoint someone else who then may be on a temporary contract and would that does that not kind of well, well, perhaps create a, an instability in the school system i just wondered how how strong the regulation is well, as against the discretion well, we well, could well, end up in a position where people just don't um, engage with it for whatever reason and then the school has to or the local authority would have to then reappoint yeah uh, the letter of the regulation says that after the first of august 2020 an individual must have the, the inter-headship uh, standard uh, unless um, they are um, appointed on a temporary period of up to 30 months. So there are some hard boundaries on that. So I suppose the literal answer to, to Joanne Lamont's question is that at the end of 30 months of a temporary contract, if somebody has not completed the inter-headship programme literally um, they should not be able to be a head teacher. But what I'm saying is that I don't think there's, I, I don't think the, the constraints of the regulation um, remove discretion to take account of legitimate circumstances that might have stopped somebody from completing within that programme. 
But if somebody was not completing the programme just by habitual non-participation or non-engagement, then the regulations, uh, the parameters of the regulation would be applied and the local authority would have to get somebody else to be the head teacher. Who may be somebody without the qualification either? Could well be. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think, I, th I think j just for completeness, I suppose I should add that within the, the nature of workforce planning, such situations would be, uh, you know, I believe local authorities would be trying to avoid situations arising of that type. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We now move to uh, Agenda Item 2, um, which is a formal debate on motion S5M 17293, Head Teachers Education and Training Standards, Scotland Regulations 2019. In the name of the Cabinet Secretary, I remind everyone that officials are not permitted to contribute to the formal debate and uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion? It moved, Kavir. Thank you. Uh, can I invite any comments from members? Do you wish to say anything further, Cabinet Secretary? Like to add, Kavir. Thank you. Uh, in that case, we move to um, the question to the committee, which is that motion S5M17293 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. The committee must report to Parliament on these instruments. Uh, our members content for me as convener to sign off and report to Parliament on the instrument. Thank you. That concludes our consideration of subordinate legislation and I spend a few, few seconds to let the officials change over. Um, can we move to agenda item three? Uh, it's final evidence session on the committee's subject choices inquiry and joining the cabinet secretary this morning are Murray McVicker, head of senior fees unit and Andrew Bruce, deputy director of learning director at the Scottish Government. Uh, and I would like to invite the cabinet secretary to make an opening statement. Thank you, Kavira. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the committee's inquiry. The purpose of education is to provide young people with the skills, knowledge and experiences that will prepare them for their life beyond school and enable them to fulfil their potential. We must ensure that our young people acquire the capacities from their school experiences that will enable them to flourish in our modern, complex, uncertain world. The national debate that led to the creation of Curriculum for Excellence envisaged a cohesive 3 to 18 education that paved the way for a broad general education and a senior phase in secondary schools. The broad general education would extend over the period from S1 to S3 and would ensure that young people acquired a breadth of experience across eight curricular areas, expressive arts, health and wellbeing, languages including English, mathematics, religious and moral education, sciences, social studies and technologies. The senior phase was envisaged as a three-year experience where young people would be encouraged to remain at school for longer and engage in deeper learning with a broader range of opportunities to develop the skills that are relevant to the wider world. I have listened with interest to the evidence the committee has gathered. The focus has fallen very heavily on the question of the number of subjects, in particular national qualifications, studied in S4. I believe this topic, however, requires broader consideration primarily because under Curriculum for Excellence, the senior phase is designed as a three-year experience with a focus on what is achieved at the end of school, rather than a focus on any given individual year. A critical requirement of Curriculum for Excellence is that schools must have the flexibility to design a senior phase that meets the needs of its learners, building on the foundations of a strong broad general education, rather than follow the more rigid structure of the pre-CFE era, which was increasingly unsuited to the needs of today's learners. It is therefore inevitable that schools will choose different approaches according to the context in which they are operating. This was made clear in guidance. In 2011, the CFE Management Board, which included representation from across the education system, published a statement on the senior phase which said 
The management, and I quote, the management board welcomes the emerging picture of bespoke senior phase models. These show that some schools will plan for five or six subjects in S4, viewing it as a way of facilitating deeper learning, making space for recognising wider achievements, and providing scope for taking qualifications over, in different, over differing timescales, for example, two-year hires. Other schools may prefer to offer, for example, eight courses of study in S4, with the option of being presented for all eight in S4 or deferring several subjects in S4, knowing that further study in these subjects will continue in S5. Similarly, some pupils may defer presentation in a subject in S5 until S6. There is broad agreement across the education system that head teachers and schools should have the freedom to design a curriculum that meets the needs of the learners in their schools. It is inevitable that this process will lead to variety around our education system. I appreciate this is challenging for many, for teachers, for parents, and for those of us around this table who grew up in a different model. But if we want to have an education system designed to equip our children and young people for the 21st century, it is inevitable that we'll, it will look different from what has gone before. However, the crux of this discussion has to be on the quality of the experience children and young people are receiving in schools across Scotland. It is therefore absolutely right that we should be asking ourselves hard questions about the quality of both the senior phase and the broad general education, and every school in Scotland should be doing so. But the key point is that the answer to those questions is unlikely to be based on whether a school has six, seven or eight column structures in S4. The answer will reside in the rationale behind the entirety of the secondary school curriculum from the broad general education into the senior phase, the quality of learning and teaching, the different pathways available and the depth and the range of partnerships that provide opportunities for young people. I do not pretend that every school in the country has this issue cracked, but many have, and that is why we have established the Regional Improvement Collaboratives to drive through deeper collaboration. We must continue to challenge our schools to ensure they are delivering a curriculum of this type, but I am confident that the approach that is being pursued is the correct one. This is backed up by the data. Official statistics on leavers published earlier this year show attainment to SCQF le at level four or better has remained broadly stable since 2012-13, whilst attainment at levels 5 and 6 has increased over this period. Last year, 62.2% of school leavers left with a qualification at level 6 or better, up from 55.8% in 2012-13. And work-based provision for young people in the senior phase is growing. The proportion of school leavers attaining vocational qualifications at SCQF uh, level 5 and above has increased from 7.3% in 2013-14 to 14.8% in 2017-18. Last year, a record proportion of school leavers went on to positive destinations, including work, training or further study. I hope this information assists the committee with its inquiry, and I look forward to addressing the points raised by members. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I invite um, Ms Smith to open questions? Uh, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if I can... Uh, put attention on to the design of the curriculum for excellence uh, for a minute. Um, we've obviously taken very substantial evidence uh, at this committee and very broadly speaking, uh, in both Education Scotland and SQA um, have intimated that they are relatively content uh, with the uh, structure and uh, Dr Brown last week did have a few issues about the uh, disconnect between broad general education and the senior phase and you yourself uh, this morning have intimated that you're generally satisfied that the approach is, is the right one. In some other evidence, particularly amongst uh, practitioners, um, we've had a rather different uh, view uh, expressed. That L Larry Flanagan uh, was very clear when he spoke to the committee that he said that at the time of the design, all the professional associations and the consultation on the new qualifications advocated retaining, upgrading and refreshing standard grades, um, but that was not amongst the options, so we moved uh, straight away to a new qualification system, and he added that he didn't feel there had been sufficient uh, consultation on that. Uh, Dr Britton, when he came to the committee, said that uh, the implementation, implementation of the senior phase came at a time when there had been, an, and as he described it, an evisceration of support at the local authority level, and from uh, the geographers, um, we got uh, a comment uh, 
the whole thing about BGE in the senior phase is that they were done the wrong way round. People thought it was a good idea to start an S1 and change the curriculum up the way, but that meant they were changing things for first, second and third year before we knew what the qualifications were going to be. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask, at the initial stages of desi designing uh, the curricular structures, are you absolutely confident that the consultation uh, was comprehensive and that it resulted in the right approach? I, I am, um, be because at the time of the design of the qualifications, um, in excess of a thousand teachers were involved in the consultation and development work around the new qualifications. So there's extensive engagement with the profession. I, I know there was an, an issue um, which pre uh, predates me that the, um, the, the EIS wanted to um, seek a delay of one year in the application of the qualifications. Um, but I think you know, my understanding and interpretation of that is that that was about um, the pace, not the substance of the reforms that were undertaken. So I think there was extensive consultation. I suppose one of my reflections is that uh, the longer I serve as Education Secretary is that I think um, th there needs to be a lot of time for consultation and there's always a feeling there could always be more. So I I'm not going to say that there's a, an absolutely finite, precise formula that, that, uh, that drives some of these considerations, but I do think there was extensive discussion. I think one of the key issues here is that, uh, and, and it's an, an issue that I very, um, I hope my opening statement indicated I was open to, is there must be, uh, one of the fundamental elements of Curriculum for Excellence is that it must be a cohesive learner journey through, from three to 18. So every part of it has got to be, have a natural flow and progression through it. So we have to be confident that when young people emerge out of what is probably the, the biggest shift in CFE, which is from the broad general education into the senior phase, that young people are properly equipped for the senior phase. That's the opportunity where we must ensure there is um, a cohesive approach for young people. And that was certainly very much in my thinking when we developed the benchmarks for uh, the broad general education, which were uh, issued in 2017. 2017, I'm pretty sure they were. Um, and we stand to be corrected. Um, that we satisfied ourselves, and I satisfied myself, that the chief examiner and the chief inspector of education were jointly signing off those benchmarks at the at the summit of the broad general education to make sure they were the, uh, the correct platform for, for young people to progress on to the senior phase. Uh, thank you. Um, this, the chief examiner said uh, last week that she felt that there had been some issues about uh, the disconnect between uh, the broad general education and uh, the senior phase. She felt that that disconnect was maybe improving a bit as in things were getting a little bit better but she did acknowledge it well, could, could, I, could I just uh, that in a sense you, the answer I've just given um, reinforces that point that I felt the benchmarks were necessary to mm. be um, issued to the education system in I'm confident it was 2017 <laughs> draft, draft in 2016 uh, final ones in 2017 where um, the, we had to be satisfied that that natural progression I talk about was being created. And I suppose the flip side of that answer is that the fact that I felt there was a need to do that indicates it was perhaps not as seamless as it should have been. Yeah. And that relates fundamentally to an essential part of what the committee is looking at, which is about the strength of the broad general education. The broad general education, because in, in my view of all of this, the broad general edu education must be sufficiently broad and sufficiently demanding to ensure that young people are properly equipped to progress onto the next stage of their learner's journey in, in the senior phase. So we have to be satisfied that is being a 
applied across the board within schools in Scotland. And the benchmarks that were put in place 2016-17 were designed to give that absolute clarity to the education system. I, I think, uh, Mr Sweeney, I entirely accept the point you make about the co cohesive uh, journey. I think that's uh, extremely important. But w it, it has been quite a concern in this committee and some of the evidence, of it, I think it is a majority of evidence, that it's not by any means universal, but it is a majority, that there is a concern <coughs> that moving from what is a very broad general education in uh, S1 to S3 does move into something, particularly in core subjects, that is much less broad than has been the case in the past. Now, I've, I've listened very carefully to what you say about having a three-year uh, programme uh, for S4 to S6, but can I just ask you uh, to reflect on what you feel when you see some of the uh, very considerable downturns in the number of pupils that are taking, uh, in particular we've had evidence that, particularly about uh, modern languages, when you see the downturn in some of these core subjects, are you satisfied that that uh, was an intentional development in the senior phase? I think some of, the, some of these factors, particularly in the downturn of uh, uptake in modern languages at, um, at National 5 level, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's growth in the uptake of modern languages at, uh, in, at, at higher level. Um, so, you know, the, so at, at, different, at different stages in the education system, there's a different picture about modern languages uptake, and at higher, there is an increase in uptake. But the, the issue at, uh, in S4 is, I think, answered perhaps by some of the evidence that Jerry Lyons gave you, um, the committee, um, a couple of weeks ago, which indicated that when there was the, the move to the broad general education and the move away from um, the 222 model, uh, modern languages um, were essentially lost their compulsory status in S4. They didn't lose their compulsory status in S3 because they are part of the broad general education, as I set out in the eight curricular areas. So I, I acknowledge that issue in S4, but when I look at participation at S5, at hires, I see rising participation. So I don't think the, the hypothesis that Liz Smith puts to me this morning is valid, or, or it's, it's, it's explained by the removal of compulsion on modern languages uh, up to S4, it, which was the case when I was at school, but obviously when it changed, uh, when we moved to the broad general education, that opportunity for breadth and depth of learning was uh, available for young people up to the end of S3 in the broad general education. But the opportunities to, to specialise uh, at later stages uh, were still available to young people and the participation levels at higher uh, indicate a, a growth in participation. But, but, I th but on that point, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I think there is an issue for modern languages that's been put to us uh, several times, not just in this inquiry, but at, uh, on other um, inquiries, that it, if you drop a language, uh, it's much uh, more difficult to take it up again uh, because of, of the continuous approach that many people feel is needed for in-depth learning of a language. So I, I think we have to be very careful about this. I think there's a genuine concern amongst uh, parents and uh, pupils uh, about the, the fact that they are asked, and I know other colleagues will come on to the difference in approaches across schools, um, as to how many subjects they can take in S4. I, I, I do believe that's a very important issue for, for parents. I, and can I just draw your attention to some of the evidence we took from young people who, who did feel that in, in many circumstances they cannot take the subjects that they want to take and feel they need to take because that column structure has been restricted. Now, I hear what you say about taking them back up again in S6 or whatever, but they actually feel that they want to do them uh, in S4, and that some of their peers are getting more options than they are. Are, are you concerned about that at all? I think there's, I think there's a, a, I think there's two issues in the question that Elizabeth has just asked me. I quite understand, firstly, that there will be young people who are unable to make all the choices that they would want to make. Um, I would venture to suggest that's probably always been a factor in Scottish education. Um, Do you think it's worse now? I don't think it's worse now, no, I don't. 
Um, I think there will be, um, just in the design of the deployment of, uh, of resources and the choices that are made in schools, there will be young people inevitably, I would, I would suggest a, min a, a, a small minority who will not be able to have essentially all the choices they would want to take. There is then, so, so that I think is a, a, an inevitability about subject choice in any education system. And, I, and I, I, I cannot, as Education Secretary, sit here and say to the committee, I can guarantee unfettered choice for every pupil in the country. Uh, and no local authority leader would be able to sit here uh, or Director of Education and offer the same thing. Second issue is whether or not there has been a narrowing of choice for young people in general in Scottish education. And I don't think that's the case. I think, actually, when I look at... And I've looked with great care in preparing for this committee at some of the choices and options that are available to young people now in Scotland. And I, I, I want to, to cite a little bit of primary evidence in this. Uh, I was looking at the, uh, the subject choices or the, cho or the options choices in Canusi High School, which is a, a school inspected uh, a, a, by Education Scotland. In 2013-14, young people in that school had 20 choices of different courses to take. In 2018-19, that's 46. So the reason for citing that, and I could give the committee other examples I was, uh, that, that, that I've looked at, um, is that I think what the committee is, it need, need, needs to wrestle with is whether or not the range of options available to young people has been broadened by CFE, which my contention is that it, it has, and schools have thought creatively about what are learners interested in doing? How can we most equip young people for the modern life? So, for example, young people in certain options that I've seen can undertake cyber security courses in school. Well, cyber security had hardly been invented when John Swinney was making these subject choices in 1978. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so... I use that to, not to be flippant, but to illustrate that's the education system responding to the world that young people are now confronted by. So, there, so, I, so I think there's, I think the committee's got to consider very carefully the question of has there been a narrowing of choice. I don't think there has been a narrowing of choice. I think there's been a, a, a broadening of opportunity for young people, but I concede it looks very different to the type of structure of education that existed when I was going through the education system, but that was envisaged by Curriculum for Excellence. That was part of the purpose of yeah. Curriculum for Excellence. M may I finish my remarks, uh, convener? Just final question. There is more choice. The trouble is, Cabinet Secretary, that choice is not necessarily in the core subjects in S4 for an awful lot of pupils. And Jim Scott's evidence is very clear about the number of schools in S4 where the core subjects, the traditional subjects, and I'm going to use that phrase because I think they're some of the most important ones, um, the, the subject choice there has narrowed. Well, I think, that, I, think that, I think the committee would have to look very carefully at what it deems to be the core choices. Because I, as I said in my remarks earlier on, in the senior, in the, the broad general education, up to S3, so that's longer than I got when I was at school, um, we were, uh, young people have an entitlement to a curriculum that delivers on the expressive arts, health and well-being, languages including English, mathematics, religious and moral education, sciences, social studies and technologies. So for a longer period, young people have access to a broader general education yes. across, and, and I would venture to That's suggest possible. that is, this is what I've co covered there is more than the core, what one might call the core curriculum. Um, and then there are opportunities for young people to develop what they have learnt in the broad general education to a further deeper level uh, over a three-year phase in the senior phase. Now, no, there are some, some uh, schools operate on a model, for example, that offers young people um, three years of choices in which they have 
uh, in the senior phase in which they have six options in each year. So over a three-year phase, they have 18 options, 18 routes they can pursue, which allows them to make different choices at different times to take forward their learning. Yep. Now, the, the one point, and I, would, you know, I, 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 and I think this is something which I, I would certainly want to take further advice about, is specifically on languages, is whether there is a substantive point in a young person who, for example, let's say, has been learning French as part of the broad general education, but then doesn't take French in S4, but returns to French in S5, if they are at any disadvantage in taking forward that, that opportunity. Now, I would need to take further advice on that question um, uh, from educationalists who would advise me on these questions. Uh, but that's, that's perhaps... Yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm saying it's about, about languages, but you know, I, I know that you know, young people will not take a subject at a particular stage, return to it later on, and I, I've not seen any data that says to me they are at an inherent disadvantage and then pursuing that at a later stage in the senior phase. Mr. Gray? Before I get to my own question, I, I, um, Cabinet Secretary, I just wanted to pursue a point that Liz Smith raised there. Do you acknowledge there's a difference between a broader choice of options of subject and the number of those subjects which it is possible to pursue? So I fully accept that when I was at school, as when you were at school, we had fewer options and subjects to choose from. But in S4, when I was at school, I could choose and pursue nine subjects, I guess maybe eight or nine when you were at school. So we could, in fact, pursue more subjects, although from a, a, a lesser menu or a narrower menu. There, there's a difference in choice between what you can choose from and how much you can actually choose. I, is, I, that, is that right? I, 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 don't, I don't think I agree with that because... Well, it's a statement of fact, surely. Well, it's not, because in our, in, in our day, of course, there was a, well, some subtle those differences. Those days were different. Affair. Some subtle differences between Mr. Gray's era Indeed. and my era, Indeed. but not that much. I shouldn't be that ingracious this morning. Um, there was a, f there was essentially, I would describe the education structure system that I was in, in what one, one might call the senior phase, as a bit of a triangle. Mm -hmm. That your your O grades were broad and it narrowed to your hires and narrowed even further to your six-year studies. Um, so. Whereas the model I've just described to Liz Smith of a three-year senior phase enables um, it to be more of a square than a triangle. See, see, I think that's a clever answer, but it's not really true, is it? Because the example you gave to Ms. Smith would imply that across the senior phase, a young person could complete 18 qualifications. I don't think, that, I don't think that's true. That's the model in South Asia. That they could complete 18 yep. exams and kind that. Well, there's six, certainly six, six choices in each of the years, and that's the model they've opted for. We've, we've, certainly, we've certainly heard of a very significant variety uh, in what uh, young people can choose in S4. We've heard, you've just given us a new example, actually. Uh, we've heard of uh, schools where young people can choose six or seven or eight subjects in S4, a handful where they can only choose five, not very many, but some. But we've also heard a lot of evidence about the variety in the way the curriculum is structured and not just the way the senior phase is structured. So we've heard of schools who operate the three plus three structure that really has underpinned your remarks this morning, but others which continue uh, effectively with a two plus two plus two structure. Um, others who operate a two plus one plus two plus one, others operate a two plus one plus three. Um, all of these, we've heard examples where young people are making course choices at the start of S2, others where they're making course choices at the start of S3, and others where they're not making course choices until the start of S4. We've heard examples of curricular structures which still timetable in columns in the more traditional way, and others where 
uh, pupils are able to make a completely free choice and then the curriculum is, is structured from that. So my question really is, at what point does that degree of curricular flexibility undermine curricular cohesion and actually become curricular chaos? Um, I think the... I, I, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't characterise it uh, in the way that Mr Gray ended his question, but I think part of what is an inherent part of curriculum for excellence, and this was what the education system debated in this parliament, this committee was actively involved in the consideration of this point, was essentially to move away from what was judged to be a rigid curriculum to a more flexible curriculum. I think that's the fundamental strategic shift that was discussed in the national debate. Was that the right thing to do? And Scotland opted to undertake that, uh, that strategic shift to create more flexibility. So the type of and range of models that Mr Gray talked about is essentially the living out of that flexibility on curricular choice. A lot of what I'm also trying to do in the system is encourage uh, a, 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 a greater focus on empowerment in schools, which I think is a necessary element in making sure that flexibility, flexibility can be deployed in an effective uh, way to deliver for young people. But there are two essential requirements that have to be judged by any school in wrestling with the issues that Mr Gray raised about the structure of the curriculum. The first is the demonstrating, well, the, the formulation of an educational rationale for pursuing a particular course of action. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that option A is superior to option B in that curricular choice. There'll be, as long as they've both got a curricular rationale and it can be demonstrated educationally, um, that will satisfy me. And secondly, that schools in formulating their, their curricular approach must engage, must engage with their parental community, their local economic environment, their local community environment, and their pupils to make sure the curriculum suits the needs of everybody within that discussion. And that will lead, inevitably, to difference and variety around the country. But I think that's a product of a curriculum which was designed to move away from rigidity to flexibility and an empowered system where we put much more of the decision making into the hands of educators. So, so that begs the question then, who is responsible for the oversight to ensure that across the piece those uh, qualities are be, that you've described are being sustained? Uh, and when Education Scotland gave evidence to the committee, uh, they were asked about this wide variety of curricular structure school structure, uh, course choice structure, all of that. Um, and they were asked about the, the, the breadth of variety and their response was they didn't know because that wasn't their responsibility. This was a responsibility for schools. So, and then when SQA gave evidence, they were asked a similar kind of question, perhaps more understandably, they made the point that their responsibility was the exam system rather than the curriculum and the running of schools. So I suppose my question is, who does have oversight of this? Is it you? Or have Education Scotland misunderstood their, their role in this? The way I'd answer that question is that this is ultimately um, a shared responsibility, but ultimately I am the Education Secretary and I'm accountable for the performance of Scottish education, and that's a responsibility I accept unreservedly. But it is a a shared responsibility because a school has to satisfy itself that it's got a good educational rationale for its curricular choice. And that, to me, is a product of the leadership within the school, the engagement of staff, the engagement with the pupil and the parent community, and also with the local um, economic community. A local authority has obviously a statutory responsibility for the delivery of education, the quality of education at local level. So it's got an, a legitimate interest in satisfying itself that curricular choices made in individual schools are appropriate. Um, and 
Not in necessarily, because the local authorities have taken different stances. You know, some local authorities have said, uh, you know, we will, off, we will operate a cohesive timetables and subject choices um, to try to help to broaden choice. Perfectly understandable model. Other local authorities have said individual schools should decide what their curricular approach should be. In my view, perfectly legitimate. As long as we're, there's enough challenge in the system to satisfy ourselves educationally about these issues. Education Scotland does exercise a responsibility in this respect because they're inspecting schools. They're inspecting schools and making a judgment about their, the, the curricular strength of individual schools. Some schools come out of that assessment well, others come out of it poorly. So a judgment has been applied about what does an individual model look like. And then from that, Education Scotland will be deducing general licence and reflections which then inform policy upon which I am advised by Education Scotland. Um, and I suppose the bit where, and, then, and obviously I have a responsibility because I'm looking at these questions in relation to what guidance does the system need. So, you know, what, you know, so what have I done in this respect? I've said to the Chief Inspector of Education, I don't think, back in 2016, I don't think there's enough clarity about what the broad general education should achieve for young people, which is why he issued guidance to the system about the nature of the broad general education and the definitive guidance on curriculum for excellence. Um, I've asked Education Scotland to uh, lead the process of ensuring that good, sound, evidenced educational practice is shared more widely across the education system. So it is a shared responsibility, and I don't say that to duck the responsibility, because I preface my remarks by saying ultimately I'm responsible for the performance of Scottish education. Um, but I do think, and professionally, and it links a, a, a bit to the agenda item we discussed as our first item today about the role of leadership. Ultimately, um, a head teacher has got to demonstrate, and in my experience, head teachers are very keen to demonstrate the educational strength of what they are leading for their young people. So, and, and just for completeness about the SQA, I think the SQA are slightly, um, don't have quite as intimate a responsibility for this because they are independently certifying qualifications. But as an education system, we must make sure, this is my, this is my view and I will, you know, I'm applying it, um, our curriculum should drive the system, not our qualifications. To, to be fair, the SQA did say that they collectively had responsibility. Education Scotland, I fear, said they had none uh, for what was happening in, in schools. So, so the position we have is that it's OK to have a degree of flexibility, which means the subject choice, timetable and curricular structure, even broad general education being two, three years, is different from school to school. We have several hundred secondary schools. And the way in which we have oversight of that is through the inspection system. But we know that some schools haven't been inspected for 15 years. For 15 years. Is that not uh, a, I, a bit of a concern, given you've got ultimate accountability? I, I, I don't think Mr Gray fairly characterises the answers that I've just given, because I talked about the different shared responsibilities. So I talked about the fact the individual schools themselves must be well-led institutions that are engaged with the pupil and parental community and staff communities on ensuring that a high quality broad general education and an appropriate senior phase is delivered for all young people in secondary schools in Scotland. So there's accountability number one. Accountable on number two is that local authorities have a statutory responsibility for the delivery of education. So local authorities should be constructively and creatively involved with schools on making sure and supporting schools to fulfil that objective. There's accountability number two. Accountability number three is that Education Scotland has a big role to play along with local authorities in regional improvement collaboratives that are there to give a platform for um, for, for, for exemplar practice. And uh, there will also be other collaborations that take place. I was um, at an event at uh, 
uh, Duncan Riggs Secondary School in East Kilbride uh, the other week there, where um, numerous schools were presenting in workshop fashion some of the enhancement work they were undertaking on curricular development. One of the themes was on broad general education, a fascinating piece of work that's been done by four secondary schools in South Lanarkshire and the East Kilbride area uh, about how they're challenging collectively their broad general education. So there's accountability type number three. And then ultimately there are the, the inspections that are undertaken. So just because a school's not been inspected by Education Scotland doesn't mean to say there hasn't been an active debate about the nature of the curriculum within the school and how that is uh, developed by uh, by the leadership of the school, by staff, uh, and by engaging with the parental community as well. But who knows that that's happened? Uh, local authorities uh, report um, on the performance of education. We have, um, they're doing that on a habitual basis. We are looking at um, all of these questions through the work in the focus on the national improvement framework on improving Scottish education. So all of these elements of the work are part and parcel of making sure that we're constantly challenging the way in which we deliver education to make sure it meets the needs of young people in the 21st century. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Can bring in Jenny Govruth. Convener, um, I'd just like to pick up on Ian Gray's point with regard to the schools that adhere to the 222 structure, um, because obviously they can't then be delivering the, the BGE as was meant to be intended. Um, so what's the answer, do you think, for those schools? I appreciate you said, Cabinet Secretary, that you're not going to see, say that option A is superior to option B, but how can you be sure the BGE is being delivered in those kind of contexts? That's, that, that's where my answer to Ian Gray is relevant that that school has to be able to demonstrate the rationale, the educational rationale that has led them to that conclusion that they can deliver the what is envisaged as the entitlement of young people through that curricular model that they take forward. Um, so, uh, uh, and ultimately to demonstrate that that addresses the entitlements that young people will have through the uh, curriculum for excellence. And by, and that has to be an active process of challenge, which um, schools must be involved in with the parental community. And ultimately, um, many of these judgments will be influenced by the outcomes that are achieved for young people, which um, obviously the school has to demonstrate how those outcomes have been strengthened as a consequence of what activity is being undertaken. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to uh, focus now on the role of the SQA and the hours allocation that are given to NQ courses. And we heard last week that the rationale for sticking with that 160 hours was simply because it was used for the legacy qualifications like Intermediate 2. Do you think that the SQA needs to look again at that hour allocation to help schools with you know, timetabling to get a bit more consistency? I think the... the, the, the I think one of the problems with the, the 160 hours allocation point is that it rather assumes that um, nothing you've learnt, a pupil has learnt in the broad general education is of any relevance to the qualification that's now been undertaken. Um, a young person will not succeed in Nat 5 maths if they don't know what one and one is. And I'd venture to suggest they learnt that a lot earlier than the start of S4. Um, in a secondary school. So I think there's a, there is a, an assumption made that um, that prior learning is not really relevant to that calculation of 160 hours. And I think that's perhaps constrained some thinking about how uh, courses should be uh, delivered. There is, however, another important element about the 160 hours, which is about what is the volume of um, activity in, that leads to qualifications that it is advisable and advantageous for young people to be undertaking for their own health and well-being in S4. Because some of the evidence that I've looked at, which has led individual schools or local authorities to perhaps reduce the number of um, national qualifications that are undertaken in S4, has been to do with an assessment of the degree of pressure and stress that was being endured by young people. And I understand and respect that as a legitimate judgment. 
Just, just on that uh, point, finally, Cabinet Secretary, with regard to the removal of the outcome and assessment standards, that was brought in by the government to reduce, in part, teacher workload. Have you carried out any assessment on how that's impacted on pupils in terms of their mental health and wellbeing? Um, we've not done that specifically on, uh, on, on that specific exercise, but obviously we are um, taking forward a range of different uh, steps in assessing the, 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 the mental health and wellbeing of young people. And it's an integral part of the approach and support of schools to make sure that that has been properly supported um, in the assistance of pupils. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before we move on to Cabinet Secretary, if I could ask a couple of questions. Um, there's no doubt that one of the concerns of the committee has been the evidence presented to, to us about the demographic correlation between subject choices and the, this, the area in which a school is, is based. And, um, and you mentioned that, you know, um, curriculum has to be built around the economics and the working with the local community, working with what's appropriate. So given that, um, that evidence and, and, and what you said, how do we ensure that societal inequality isn't being built into the system if it continues to be um, based on, on demographics? And how do we ensure that, um, you know, really good pupils in more disadvantaged areas have the opportunities to succeed, and also that those who maybe aren't as academically capable are being supported in areas to, to maybe have an articulation route or access modern apprenticeships. The committee will, uh, I'm sure, be exhausted by hearing me saying that the direction of Scottish education is about delivering excellence and equity for all, and that you know is a is a summary. Um, point of our aspirations, but it has to be t turned into a tangible, practical reality in every locality in our country. So I would be deeply concerned if I saw a situation where, um, by the nature of social and economic background, young people were not getting access to opportunities. Now, I don't think that's what is happening, and I don't see the evidence. I see young people in, I can see young people in areas of, uh, of multiple deprivation having access to a good quality range of options um, based on their interests and their perspectives and their capacities. Um, but I remain open to being certain that that is the case. And it has to be the case because young people have to be, have to have the opportunities to progress in whichever way they, 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 they wish to. So the learner journey for those individuals has got to be appropriate. It's got to be designed for those young people. And for some of those young people, it will be about um, securing a modern apprenticeship. For others, it will be about securing university entrance qualifications. And in whichever circumstance, their aspirations should be fulfilled and the, the nature and the location, the background of their school or their environment should not be an impediment to that. Okay, thank you. Cabinet Secretary, can I move to Dr. Allen? Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, uh, Cabinet morning. Secretary. Um, you've discussed a bit today about the, the variety that there is uh, across the, the country in terms of, of the number of choices at um, S4, and you, you've just mentioned there um, uh, in more detail about that. But I just wonder if you can say something more about the kind of criteria that, that different schools might be using or whether the, the government or Education Scotland gathers a picture of the kind of criteria that, that schools are using uh, when they come to that decision, is it six or seven subjects in, in S4? I think the, 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 the judgment, fundamentally, I think that judgment has to be driven by a dialogue between um, the school and the people in parental community. I think fundamentally that uh, is relevant. Um, and the judgment should be based on the necessity to ensure that young people have both a, bread, a, 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 a suitable breadth of opportunity and also a breadth of choice in the routes that they can pursue. So th th those would strike me as being the fundamental issues that have to be considered at a local level. The importance of understanding the context within which schools are operating, 
the economic opportunities that may well be available to young people is also a critical factor. So that dialogue and relationship to the business community, particularly through developing Scotland's young workforce, which has now been taken forward with um, uh, tremendous uh, enthusiasm in different parts of the country um, should structure the, 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 the choices and the judgments that are made. You mentioned there that one of the factors has to be about ensuring there's a sufficient breadth. I mean, in that case, do you feel that there's a minimum, uh, there should be a minimum number on offer? A small number of schools offer five and fourth year. So uh, without trying to pin you down to tell what those schools want to do, I mean, do, do you feel that the breadth is dependent on there being any minimum number of subjects offered in fourth year? I think the, uh, there has to be suitable breadth offered for young people. And I, I, in the, um, in the guidance that uh, the chief inspector issued in, well, I, I said in my earlier comments that the curriculum management board envisaged a range between five and eight. Um, I think anything that reduced below that, I think, would be would raise some serious questions and I'm, I'm not sure I would understand the educational rationale for such an approach. Um, but uh, I think that's a, yeah, that is a material factor in uh, a judgment on that point. And in terms of the, the group of people who leave at the end of uh, S4, and I appreciate as you've said yourself, that's a much smaller group than it was 20 or 30 years ago as a, as a share of the, of the school population. Um, does the number of subjects offered in, in fourth year have, have an impact, you feel, on, on the, the number of qualifications or the, or the opportunities that they can come out of school with? Or are there other routes available to them in fourth year that would, that would compensate for that? Well, I think the, the, the nature of education provision is changing. One of the words I used in my introductory remarks was the importance um, of the partnerships that are established, because increasingly schools are now operating with a, a much greater uh, sense of partnership working beyond the school uh, the school boundaries and um, so relationships with colleges are critical in broadening the opportunities that are available for young people now there are although there are young people who are staying on longer in school there's the overwhelming majority of young people are now staying on uh, to complete their education to s6 uh, within schools they won't be in schools all the time mm -hmm. They'll spend part of that week in colleges or in other settings. So there is a, whilst the school provides the anchor for the education of young people, they are drawing on relationships with a whole range of other organisations, which also enhances the choices and the opportunities that are available for young people. So I think the, um, and then obviously there will be some young people who want to, go off to pursue those opportunities full time f by leaving at S4. Um, I, I, you know, my judgment about the education system is the system is very much more focused today on the destinations that young people are going on to, um, that they individually, they want to be satisfied that young people are going on to good destinations. Um, so therefore, a school, schools will work very hard in partnership with Skills Development Scotland counsellors that are available within schools to make sure that young people are making considered judgments about what their next opportunities will be, even if they decide to leave at S4, which the prevailing view is that most young people stay on beyond that. So it, it's important that that quality of advice and information and support is available to young people to enable them to make uh, the, the, the wisest choice possible. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, Ms Lamont. Thank you. Um, really to go back to some uh, follow on from the points made by the Convener, um, I want to ask just first about specific, a specific group of young people um, looked after children. Sales has told us that about 75% of looked after children will leave school in fourth year and that therefore presents a challenge if the curriculum is delivered over three years. You would have an aspiration that these young people may choose to stay on, but the circumstances may um, not le lend themselves to that. What is, what is the answer to that, that there will be young people who will leave school at the end of fourth year? How do we ensure that there is, a, there is enough opportunity in the fourth year to allow young people to leave with a reasonable set of qualifications? I, I think the... I think if a young person 
you know, I, I would be satisfied that young people have access to a range of opportunities in S4 to be able to acquire um, a good range of qualifications. I think the specific question that John Lamont raises with me about looked after children is um, a very deep and challenging question that we, you know, we are committed to and actively working uh, uh, to address uh, with Celsius and you know, I uh, took part in a, a really fantastic Celsius education conference just a couple of weeks ago which was focusing on how we can improve even further the positive impact of education on looked after children. We've seen um, progress made in recent years and the data demonstrates that looked after children are achieving better educational outcomes today than they were 10 years ago, but it's still not good enough. I readily concede that. And that, I think, the opportunities to, to be successful in that are uh, tied up with making sure that, that those young people have a curricular approach that meets their needs and supports them in their aspirations. So the flexibility of curriculum, for instance, I think enables that to be the case because young people will be able to make a range of choices, not just about what we might call, um, what are called national qualifications, but a range of other opportunities and awards that will give them uh, foundations upon which they can build later in life. But you can see the contradiction that if you say, well, it has to be over the three years, and we know that the most disadvantaged young people will leave at the end of fourth year, and that kind of follows on from Professor Scott's um, research, which suggests that the most disadvantaged young people are leaving with fewer qualifications than they did in the past. Now, these are big issues. I just wonder if you would make a commitment to look at this in terms of this argument around the three-year curriculum, but actually, for some the most disadvantaged young people, that may be compounding problems for them. If, firstly, yes, I, I will. It's an issue that... that, that, that uh, that, that does concern me, hence my active engagement with Celsius and the government supports Celsius to undertake important and valuable education work for looked after children and the uh, data that uh, was being highlighted at the Celsius Education Conference was demonstrating that we actually can make significant enhancements in the performance of these young people but it has to be part, uh, but it has to be achieved with the requisite amount of support and assistance to enable young people to do that. And the second thing is that I think the, the committee and its inquiry, I hope, will look at the range of uh, different awards and recognitions of achievement that young people can have access to. Um, one of the, the schools I visited um, recently was Bells Hill Academy, where one of the uh, the subjects that they make available, the options they make available to young people within the curriculum is the Duke of Edinburgh's award. And the judgment of the, and the, the pupils explained to me the benefits they got from that. And the, 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 the head teacher and her staff were explaining to me afterwards that in many respects they find the Duke of Edinburgh award equips those young people with a resilience to deal with the challenges that they face which is of immense value to them. Now that will not that will not register on national qualifications, but it is providing a capacity and a capability for those young people which will be beneficial for them. And I think it's important that in this inquiry we look at that whole range of different opportunities and options which are designed to strengthen uh, the life chances of young people. I think we'd want to make sure those range of options were applied equally across um, different schools. So, for example, if you were able to establish that the range of options, it transpires that in a less disadvantaged school, you've got a range of what would be called core subjects to access, and somewhere else you've got fewer of those, but you have Duke of Edinburgh. That, I would suggest implications for some young people in disadvantaged areas who could achieve very significant levels of qualification. I think there's just an issue there. Mm. Can I ask I you think, about... I think, I think on, on the point of... On the point of um, the, the, the nature of um, core subjects. So my, my, my view very firmly is that the broad general education provides that coverage of 
what one might call core subjects. And indeed, I, but of course, I would be interested in, in the committee's definition of what it considered to be core subjects as part of this inquiry. And I think that flows through into the options that are available for young people in the senior phase by a combination of the national qualifications and the other awards that are available to young people. Yeah, well, there's a whole argument around um, uh, qualification or, or certification for all that we, we maybe won't deal with here. Can I speak, ask you about specifically around one area where we've been given quite a lot of evidence is around multi-level teaching. Um, as you know, Larry Flanagan described it as an explosion in multi-level teaching. We know evidence from a focus group of teachers. This was a significant concern to them. And it wasn't something any longer that was by exception, but was increasingly the norm. Um, do you um, believe that it is acceptable for it to become the norm? Or do you, is this something you're going to keep under investigation? Um, I, I'm, 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 I'll be interested to look further to this question because I, um, I don't think there is, I, I've not seen any data that would allow me to make a judgment about whether there's been an explosion or not. And I don't think that data exists. But it, so may, it is reasonable to suggest that the General Secretary of the EIS um, may have an awareness of that and wouldn't see it lightly. Would it concern you if there were an explosion in multi-level teaching? Well, to, 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 to come to a view that there has been an explosion, there would have to be some degree of quantification. So you do that then? And I haven't seen it. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I'll, I'll look carefully at, at these issues because I don't think, in, in, in principle, um, I've not seen any educational argument that says there is something inherently um, a damaging about multi-level teaching. Really? Because multi-level teaching has been part of the Scottish education system for mm. a long, long time, maybe all time. But, but not, a, not routinely. I can understand by exception. Well... I can understand by exception. I, what I would like a commitment from you on, that you would research this and that you would look at whether there's an issue in particular subjects. There's some evidence that would suggest, particularly in sciences, putting a nap four, nap five, higher and advanced higher, might be a timetable inconvenience, but actually as an educational challenge, and teachers have told us that. Well, I think the, I think the, I think the issue that, um, I think the, the important uh, test of this is, is about the educational challenge and the educational issues involved in multi-level teaching, because multi-level teaching has been around the education system for all the time that I can remember. So, and I've never heard anybody argue educationally there is something wrong with multi-level teaching. What I, so I will- Sorry, forgive me, do you think it's acceptable for somebody to try and teach advanced higher physics, higher physics, Nat five and Nat four in the one class. Well, uh, that that. Do you I, think that's uh, is that an optimal environment for a young person to learn in? I, I, well, I, it depends the context. You see, I've seen examples of teaching in Scotland where, for example, different levels of teaching have been undertaken in a classroom setting with a number of professionals involved in that teaching. So, supporting young people through some science licence, which had been a multi-level multi science licence, supported by a number of teachers and a number of technicians, providing a very active, engaged learning environment for young people. Now, educationalists are delivering that. It didn't look to me like a timetable inconvenience, but I'm very happy to explore it and to look into it in greater detail. But fundamentally, if there has been an educational disadvantage of multi-level teaching, it's something that's been around Scottish education for a long, long time. Well, I'm old enough to remember when there was a, a physics principal teacher, a biology principal teacher, a chemistry principal teacher, and that they had higher classes, or grade classes, and so on. So it may have happened on occasion. I do not accept that it was the norm. And I think what we are trying to establish is whether it's becoming the norm. It would be really helpful if there was some research done in that, but this separate question on this is an issue of equity. Because if you're in a school where you have a very large senior uh, cohort, you could end up with very little multi-level teaching because you've got the numbers to make up the classes. But in more disadvantaged areas, you could end up in a position where it's the norm for you to be taught 
in a group that's multi-level, which compounds, in my view, disadvantage. Is this something that you're willing to look at? I, I certainly will look at that because I, I don't want any disadvantage, but there are, of course, alternative models that are brought forward. So, um, for example, the I was talking to uh, a young man yesterday at the Caritas Awards ceremony who was explaining to me, he comes from a school, um, St Mungo's Academy in uh, the, the Gallowgate, uh, where there was no provision for advanced higher maths, but he was able to undertake that at the Advanced Hires Hub at Glasgow Caledonian University, where he was um, in a class with other advanced higher students from a number of different areas around the city of Glasgow in what I consider to be an excellent educational innovation. And the school, you know, that's provided for. City of Glasgow has obviously got an amount of critical mass that enables that to be put in place, but there are other models of that type that are taken forward in different fashions around the country. So I there, there I are different models. I accept that, and I've, I've had the privilege to, to learn about the Glasgow Caledonian model, and, and I under, understand that all schools can't offer every subject. But the question is whether you're more likely, in a, an area of dis, in a, dis, a school in a disadvantaged area, to be in a multi-level class and to have to travel for, um, to do a variety of subjects. And would you accept that that in itself is perhaps amplifying disadvantage? That, accept that, the challenges of it. But if you're in a position where a school is routinely, uh, because of the constraints upon it, um, organising multi-level teaching where other schools are not, and where young people have to travel, do you not accept that if you were going to do an equality impact assessment in that, you might be able to identify disadvantage? A very smart young person in one school not being taught in a multi-level class and a very smart young person in another routinely being taught in multi-level class. I, I think, I, I think fundamentally, you know, that there are some educational inequalities issues to wrestle with in this question. If you take the example of the young man I was talking about yesterday, um, if he'd wanted to advance higher maths at St Mungo's Academy, he might have been told by the head teacher, "I'm sorry, we can't offer it." So he's at. So I accept. I'm not. That's not. No, 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 well, well, that's well, not well, the well, point well, I'm making. Well, I'm saying, I accept that the solution for that young man is an excellent one, and that it, it's better than the choice that you can't do it at all. What I'm asking you to explore is whether these solutions disproportionately are, having, are, are for young people in disadvantaged areas. Um, well, and particularly the one in multi-level teaching, well, because but, uh, I think what, that's what, of a different order. But I, was trying to, I, was trying to be, I was trying to be helpful in the way I was answering that, that question a second ago, because I think you, cause all of these questions have to be considered together. If that young man had been unable to get that course delivered in St Mungus Academy, and there was no other option, I accept that would, he would be at a disadvantage. But there's another option available to him which enables him to do that. That involves him travelling. Mm -hmm. So there may be an element of um, disadvantage involved in that because he's got to move about. Equally, the young people that I've met at the Caledonian University Hub told me they loved coming to the Caledonian University Hub because they're in a university environment mm -hmm. and they didn't feel like school pupils any longer. So they were loving it. So I think there's a... You know, I, I, I don't think any of these issues are neatly compartmentalised. But what I do give Joanne Lamont the commitment to is that I have absolutely no interest whatsoever in tolerating a situation where young people are unable to fulfil opportunities because of disadvantage. I, that, that's what I'm trying to attack at all times, and I give the commitment to the committee that I'll do exactly so that. So you'd be willing to then specifically to research this question of multi-level teaching and where it's mo most prevalent? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll look carefully at what the committee uh, considers on, on on this point, but you know, as I say, I don't think there's a, I don't see, um, I think multi-level teaching has been part of Scottish education. Um, I will look carefully at the issues involved in it, but I've not seen yet any evidence of educational disadvantage. But you would accept that in our evidence from the focus groups and from the general secretary, they have identified it as a problem. I, I recognise what you've heard. Yes. Thank you, okay, Mr. Mandel. Thank you, I convener. Just, just on that, that point, I mean, I don't see, Cabinet Secretary, how you can not see, you know, if, if you're saying you're not seeing evidence and you don't then look for it, you know, it kind of, it, it doesn't seem very satisfactory. So, I mean, again, I would add my voice, you know, in, in terms of actually seeing, seeing some research, uh, because my experience in my own local authority 
uh, having been a school pupil there not, not all that long ago, was that things have certainly changed and where being in multi-level classes you know, was, was something that was done when absolutely necessary before it is now something which seems to happen on a fairly routine basis. So I would, I would ask you to, to look at that. I'll consider that, yeah. um, I'm interested to go back to the previous point you were making about accountability, um, and particularly the example of South Ayrshire. Um, is the 18 subjects model something that happens in every school in that authority? Uh, I believe it to be, yes. Sir. And where, where was that decision taken? And do you think that it's right for local authorities to tell all schools uh, within their authority how many subjects they should be offering uh, in each year? I understand the discussion took place um, between the local authorities, the head teachers, and the parental communities, and they came to those conclusions. And would you then expect that same decision-making process to happen in all 32 local authorities in Scotland? No, I would. Uh, I think crucially for me is that schools have got to be satisfied with the model that has been deployed because they are the educators. Um, as Mr Mandel will be familiar from my wider agenda on education issues, I believe that schools should be um, the determinants of more and more of their curricular choices. So. If this model, for example, was to have been imposed on schools without their consent, I would be, I would not find that acceptable. But if schools conclude uh, in a discussion involving the parental and pupil communities and with the local authority that that's the appropriate approach to take, then um, I, I would leave them to take that judgment. So just to be absolutely clear, you'd think it was wrong for a local authority to say it? a kind of mandatory number of, of subjects for, for schools and its, its authority? If it did that without dialogue with the schools involved, yes. OK, thank you. Um, and just on uh, rural schools, I mean, obviously, uh, South Ayrshire is a neighbouring authority uh, to the one I represent. Um, and I, I just wonder if they're able to offer that consistency across an area that takes in uh, some more urban communities and, uh, and some more rural communities, uh, why it wouldn't be possible to, to, to see that offered uh, else, elsewhere, and whether you'd have a co comment on that. In relation to... Well, just the variability between what's offered in rural schools and what's offered in schools in a more urban setting, why South Ayrshire would think it was appropriate to have a standardised approach uh, that, 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 would, that would cover both rural and urban communities to make sure there was a, an equality of opportunity, yet other local authorities would seem, would seem uh, to find it more difficult to offer that consistency. Mm. Well, that, obviously, these are, as I, as I said in my answers, these are, uh, these are matters that I think should be primarily uh, decided at school level. Um, and if there's a collaboration uh, amongst um, schools within a local authority area to come to an, an agreed position that involves schools in that discussion, then I think that's perfectly acceptable. Um, but it's obviously up to individual school communities to make those judgments. And does it concern you that in some uh, rural schools they're offering, they're, they're struggling to offer uh, the same number of choices, and also a, you know, a, a smaller, uh, they're, they're in effect offering a smaller sort of menu of choices as well? Does that does that concern you? Uh, I I would be concerned if there was a reduced menu of choices being available to young people, um, and if there are examples that Mr Mandel is concerned about, I'd be, I'd happily consider uh, any particular examples of that. Uh, I do, however, you know, when I, um, uh, when I was visiting um, a Dalbiti High School, which I concede is not in Mr Mandel's constituency, um, I saw a pretty broad curricular offering being made available there, including the, um, the rather surprising sight of walking down a corridor in the school uh, past the usual arrangement of computer suites and home economics rooms to then walk into a full motor engineering garage at the end of the corridor, which rather surprised me, which was part of their offering of um, applied engineering skills because of the challenges in the rural area of young people being able to access college courses because of all the issues of travel and distance. Uh, with which Mr Mundell will be familiar. So um, I think, you know, obviously I, I'm very happy to explore any particular situations that Mr Mundell wants to bring to my attention, but 
I, you know, I do think that schools make a, a real endeavour to provide that breadth of opportunity. So I guess, I guess that highlights my own point, which is if they're able to do that at WT High School, you know, within part of Dumfries and Galloway, why would pupils right across the region not expect you know, the same range of choices? Well, I'm, I'm, but I'm sure there'll be things that go on at other schools within the, uh, the locality which are not going on in the WT High School because choices will be made locality by locality about and Do you not what see that creates a little bit of a lottery for young people themselves when it comes to the options they want to pursue? Because you couldn't, for example, easily travel from uh, Moffat or uh, Locker Bay or Langham or Annan to WT on a regular basis to access that course, just like travelling to the college might be difficult. Well, I, I, I totally accept that um, in rural Scotland, some of these choices can be a bit more difficult because of rurality. I, 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 reserve, I represent a rural area. I know exactly these challenges. Um, but there are um, models which can be deployed to try to ensure that the broadest possible a choice of is available to young people. Um, I stress if there's a, you know, if there are issues that are of concern about the availability of course choices, uh, I'll happily explore those. But you know, we have taken other measures to try to expand the access to different options. Uh, the government invested in a joint venture with the Western Isles Council on the East School, which is now supporting the delivery of education. Um, in about 22 local authority areas around the country where uh, learning is being deployed digitally across uh, a whole range of different subjects. Uh, I think it is, it's, sorry, 21 um, uh, local authorities. And um, the, you know, there's a whole range of different subjects that uh, are able to be deployed through that medium, which can be of assistance. And actually, the Fish and Gallery is one of the local authorities that's uh, receiving courses through yeah, the think, school I measure. Not, not every school's in the position to, to offer them, but that's, you know, I, I'll write to you separately. But well, please do, yeah. A few examples. Happily do, yeah. Thank you, Kavita. Ms Mackay. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you said earlier that um, the curriculum should drive the agenda, not qualifications. Um, you also said earlier that we're achieving record exam passes and positive destinations, so I guess that would indicate that the curriculum is working. But I wanted to um, go back to the, the schools having a flexible uh, approach to the, the senior phase and, and you're saying that you know, they should really set the agenda according to the needs of their community rather than the local authorities um, imposing um, structures on them. Do you feel that there's enough um, uh, encouragement given to parents and local communities to have a, a say in, in, that, in that curriculum or, or subject choices? And is that a practical or workable arrangement? Um, I, I think it is practical and workable because the committee has heard itself of parental dialogue that's taken place to formulate um, agreement around the curricul curriculum choices that are made uh, and the uh, discussions that the committee had two weeks ago with a range of local authority representatives, a number of whom had been head teachers and had presided over this process, I think demonstrates that it's it's practical and plausible to do exactly that and of enormous value to do that. Whether it's happening in every case is a different matter altogether. And that's what I would is concede. Is that really up to the school to encourage that? Well, it's not. Yes, it is. And, and in the national improvement framework, we lay a very heavy emphasis on um, parental involvement in all aspects of education and educational choice. So we are... Uh, if the committee was to look at the, um, the National Improvement Framework, we have a distinctive element there about parental involvement, which is not a, just about who's going to be a member of the Parent Council this year. It's about active involvement and dialogue with parents about what formulates the curriculum and what should be its components. I think that dialogue helps to address some of the other issues the committee has heard about, whereby it may the curriculum may seem, well, it will seem different to parents to what many of them will have experienced. Um, so the curriculum, as I've said a couple of times already this morning, the curriculum that's available today in Scottish education is very different to the one that I experienced. So the best way to, is, is to engage parents in that discussion and that debate mm -hmm. to make sure that they've got an active sense of uh, what is the formulation of the curriculum and how it should be taken forward. 
Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to return to a thread that um, Ian Gray, the convener, and Joanne Lamont were pursuing. If there was evidence of an inequality in the system, either one that was emerging or one that had existed for some time, such as around subject availability, where would the responsibility lie for identifying that? Would it lie with Education Scotland? Um, it would essentially... Well, I think the where, where it would emerge is in the discussion around the... Um, the strength and the efficacy of the curriculum of an individual school, because ultimately this is about a school by school choice. Because as I've, as I've laboured through my evidence this morning, it, schools are offering a different, different curricula, different curricular approaches, um, and we took a strategic decision as a country to move away from a rigid prescribed curriculum and into a more flexible curriculum. Now, by taking that decision, we essentially open up the possibility for variety and within that, individual schools must be satisfied that they are taking the correct curricular approach. Now, the, in terms of the, the accountability and the scrutiny of all of that, that, as I explained in my answer to Ian Gray, comes at a number of different levels. It comes at school level in their discussion with parents and pupils. It comes at local authority level and the interaction with the schools as to whether local authorities feel in their professional educational expertise that the needs of young people are being effectively met. And it comes through the, um, the work that we share through Education Scotland on delivering best practice and highlighting good practice and also in the inspection evidence that uh, emerges. So you said earlier on that ultimately as Cabinet Secretary for Education you, you are responsible. Who takes it to you? If I accept what you're saying about uh, this is about giving as much flexibility to individual schools as possible, but if a national trend appears to be emerging or to have existed uh, in the first place, it's beyond the issue of individual schools. If, if we can say that the schools that all follow a particular demographic disposition are all disadvantaged by one particular issue, such as what we've discussed around subject availability, surely there comes a point where I would assume it's Education Scotland. It is their responsibility to take it to you as the Cabinet Secretary and say this appears to be a national problem. This is not something isolated to one or two local authorities or one or two schools. There is a clear trend across the country here. If it's a national problem, surely our national education agency has a responsibility to identify it, to look into whether or not that's actually the case, and ultimately to take it to yourself. I, I think that's what Education Scotland are doing in their assessment of, um, in, their, in both their inspection activity, where you know, Education Scotland, and you know, looking at the, you know, the, the, the criteria of um, uh, that, that are looked at, the, the, the quality indicators that are looked at in inspections are leadership of change, learning, teaching and assessment, ensuring well-being and quality and inclusion and raising attainment and achievement. And in at least, um, well, I, I actually in all of those quality indicators, um, they are relevant to the nature of the curricular choice that has been undertaken by a school. So if... Education Scotland sees a pattern emerging out of inspections, then that is obviously an issue that they would raise. Um, there is a, a second element of Education Scotland's work, which is, in my view, a crucial product of the inspection, is about what lessons are deduced from the, um, the inspection evidence to inform policy frameworks. But I don't view this task as just exclusively that for Education Scotland. Um, local authorities will have a perspective on this. And for that reason, that was one of the reasons why, and, the, and also the professional associations will have a perspective. And it was for that reason that I created the Scottish Education Council, which I chair, which brings together, amongst others, Education Scotland, the SQA, directors of education, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, and representatives of the regional improvement collaboratives and the professional associations and the general teaching council and young people and parents so that we can have a forum in which these trends can be considered and assessed and I can build cohesion around what are the right steps to take forward because fundamentally Curriculum for Excellence was created as a product of extensive 
uh, dialogue to achieve a consensus within Scottish education, and that's, that's the spirit in which I'm trying to take matters forward. So to look at one specific trend, then, the, the one that uh, has come up a couple of times this morning, and I raised it with Education Scotland when they were in, uh, the Times, almost two years ago now, through a pretty simple series of freedom of information requests, uh, published the fact that uh, schools in Scotland's uh, most deprived communities were offering their pupils, uh, on average, a choice between 17 subjects at higher, and schools in our least deprived or most privileged communities were offering, on average, a choice between 23 hires. Now, not to get bogged down in the absolute specifics of those numbers, do you acknowledge that there is a gap in the availability of hires that is correspondent to the level of deprivation in the community a school is located? Um, I, I would have to look carefully at whether there's a pattern there because I think what depends also on the choices that are made about where we, where we are judging the deprivation to exist. Are we judging the deprivation to exist based on the location of the school or the home residence of the pupils? Because that will have a difference, because you will have schools located in um, what will be judged to be areas of, of multiple deprivation, but their pupil cohort might not be exclusively emerging with pupils coming from deprived backgrounds, uh, and, and conversely the other way around. Um, I think also, we have to look at some of the issues that we've raised already about um, pooling arrangements for the provision of certain courses because of numbers of pupils. Um, there may be, you know, if I think about the city of Perth that I represent, uh, or I represent part of the city of Perth, um, the four secondary schools in the city um, operate some shared arrangements to ensure that young people have access to broader choice. So school A will not, will, let's for argument's sake say, doesn't provide um, biology, but school B will. So it will not show up in school A's profile, but it will show up in school B's profile. So I think there's, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly I'm very open to exploring the questions about um, deprivation because I don't, as I said, fundamentally, I don't want young people in Scotland uh, to be inhibited in their opportunities to progress because of the background from which they've come. So I, I appreciate that. How should it then be explored? And, and this gets back to my original question. Surely, if this evidence is emerging and what the Times has done is not unique, Professor Jim Scott's done essentially the, the same thing, Other, uh, others have done the same, EIS have expressed concern about this. Surely then the responsibility ha goes to Education Scotland to identify whether this is in fact a national issue, whether there is a trend here. Because I'm, I'm just not clear where else it would, it would lie. If, if research was to be commissioned, surely it would be Education Scotland who would do that and would take it back to yourself. Um, I think in terms of, uh, I think we, you know, it, it's an issue, to, part of, I'm, I'm not in, in any way trying to be kind of obtuse here, but th these are not neatly compartmentalised issues. Because curriculum design, for example, ultimate policy responsibility for curriculum design rests with the Scottish Government and it rests with me as the Education Secretary. Um, so, but obviously I'm significantly advised in that respect by Education Scotland. So it's, you know, I, I don't think it's about compartmentalising it into one institution. I, I, I accept, you know, I'm the Education Secretary, I'm accepting that uh, these are material issues to be considered and I'm very happy to explore them. I appreciate that. Education Scotland would not accept that this was an issue. So it is certainly one worth exploring. One thing they did mention, though, Alan Armstrong, when, when he was giving evidence to us, said that uh, the Scottish Government have started commissioning research into the whole learning offer in schools across qualifications. That was in response to my asking about the availability of hires. Would you be able to give us any more detail on exactly what that research is? Will that research cover the questions that I've asked around the availability of hires and its relationship with the deprivation of a school's catchment area? Um, I would have to refresh my memory about the details of uh, all that's uh, involved in that exercise, um, which it is, looking at, it is looking at breadth of offer, yes, um, around 
But crucially, it's not just about national qualifications. It's about national qualifications and other yeah. uh, opportunities and awards. So it's, it's, it's essentially, it's assessing the, um, the spread of the debate that I've advanced in my opening remarks to the committee this morning, that I don't think we can just look at this through the prism of national qualifications. It has to be a broader analysis, and that's what the exercise is looking at just now. I just for, for completeness, that is a, a survey um, of it's the Scottish Government Senior Phase Head Teacher Survey, and uh, I've approved its contents, and I expect that to be distributed uh, eminently. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I hope to, but I, I hope to have that responses to that able to be analysed to enable me to respond to the report that comes out from the committee. Thank you very much. Um, final question, I think, from Mr Gray. Mr Swinney, a very specific question. Uh, a number of the submissions the committee received um, raised concerns about the National Four qualifications specifically. A number described, them, uh, described it as worthless. Um, I put that to the Chief Examiner uh, when she gave evidence to the committee. Uh, she didn't accept that analysis, but she conceded that there was a problem of credibility with the National Four exam. And I just wonder if you share that view. I, I, I do, and I, I, I well, I, I share both views that there is that National Four is a valuable qualification, but I also accept that there are problems in its perception, and we are taking a number of steps to try to to build that credibility um, by the one of the issues which I think has been um, a, a factor has been the existence of what is called fallback, whereby if a young person did not receive a satisfactory level in, um, in um, National 5, they would automatically get a, a well, they wouldn't automatically, as long as they had the, the unit history to demonstrate performance, they could get um, a, a National 4. I think that symbolically made that look like a qualification that was a bit of a compensation. And I've removed that now to ensure that we are able to promote and explain the value of National 4 to parents and to young people and to external stakeholders um, as representing significant learning, which is of value to young people. And that's just one of the measures that we're taking forward to try to strengthen that. Um, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and your officials for your attendance at committee this morning. I won't just suspend for five minutes, but can I remind members we will be coming back into public session.
Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, we will now move to um, agenda item four, public petitions, PE 1694. Um, it's in the name of Ralph Riddock on the subject of free instrumental music services and was detailed in paper four of the committee meeting papers. Uh, it outlines the history of the petition and the work undertaken by this committee on this matter, which has been substantive. As members will be aware, the committee has completed its inquiry into instrumental music situation, published its report, considered the responses from the Scottish Government and COSLA, and debated the report in the Chamber. The paper also points out that the petitioner has launched a crowdfunding campaign for legal action to challenge the lawfulness of charging for instrumental music tuition in schools. Um, and members will have seen that the papers ask the committee to consider closing its consideration of the petition on the basis that it intends to monitor the progress of the legal challenge on charging for instrumental music tuition and reserves the right to revisit this issue in its future work programme. Do members have any comments? Are we content to close that petition at this stage? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item five is another public petition, PE 1692, uh, in the name of Leslie Scott on behalf of Times Trust and Alison Proust on behalf of the Scotland Home Education Forum. The petition calls for an inquiry into the human rights impact of GIRFIC policy and data processing. Paper five in the meeting papers outlines the history of the petition. This agenda item is intended to be an initial discussion on the petition. It suggests options for gathering information that could serve as a useful context for the committee's next consideration of the petition. As the paper sets out, the findings of the GIRFEC practice panel was, will be relevant to the committee's more substantive consideration of the petition, which will take place once the findings are in the public domain. Do members have any comments on the petition, including the options set out by the clerks at this time? Do you think the petition makes some uh, extremely valid points? And I, and I think there, there are likely to be some um, interesting points to be developed from that petition uh, following the updated guidance. I mean, I think it's a fair point to investigate this further. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the issues that, 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 that was flagged up um, in the petition was that while advice had been withdrawn, it still was informing practice, and that was the concern. That, and I suppose that is the kind of issue that's going to be dealt with through the uh, code of practice. So it feels to me that and it's obviously around the broader question of the named person and people who are concerned about the implications of that. But the idea that while that debate is ongoing, some of the ideas behind it had been implemented, I think, was what the concern of the petitioners were. And certainly from the public petitions committee point of view, it felt that to deal with it in the context of our consideration of um, the, 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 the code of practice on kind of made sense. Um, there are two options. Um, the committee could write to the Scottish Government seeking its perspective on how, to how the framework for the functioning of independent bodies operates where multiple remits are engaged on a particular issue. For example, the petitioners raised the case that, the hum that cover human rights considerations, including rights of the child, the processes of local authorities, the process of NHS boards, and also the appropriate sharing of processing data. Are we content to write to the government on that issue? Okay. And the second um, option was the committee could write to ICO seeking an update on its work following the introduction of GDPR, including any issuing of updated advice and other work with organisations to ensure the shift in data processing practices from those adopted under the Data Protection Act including moving away from practices based on the 2013 ICO advice and the 2016 advice. So we're content to write to the Commissioner on that area. Thank you very much. Um, and that um, completes the formal part of the meeting. We'll close and move into private session.